I'm Jem, I run a music PR and marketing company here in DC called Imagine PR. And I work with a number of independent musicians in the area and direct to fan marketing is something that comes up in conversation a lot. Um, it's been a, a buzz phase in, in the industry for some time now. Uh, we've all heard of artists, we've all heard second hand of artists who have launched very <coughs> successful and innovative campaigns. However, what works for one artist doesn't necessarily work for another, as Katie said. So today we want to cut through the hype and really find out from the artists directly themselves what is actually working for them and what kind of advice and insights can they offer to other artists um, in a similar situation. So uh, we've got a great uh, diversity of panellists with us today from all different music genres. Um, Jill, if we could start with you. Um, in 2009, you very successfully um, raised nearly $80,000 in fan donations. Could you tell us a little bit about your experiences and the process you went through to get to that stage? Sure. Well, I think it was lucky. It was actually in end of 2008, and it was I was lucky because it was right before the economy fell. So mm -hmm. that was good. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was before there was a Kickstarter or, or anything. And, and I've been on two major labels and two indies that went bankrupt, and I'm like, okay, what am I going to do now? I have a bunch of these songs, and the thought of trying to sell myself and go have another meeting in an A and R office seemed seemed horrific. So I thought, okay, uh, one semi-drunken evening with a friend who was a trades uh, web, so we thought we'd do Jill's Next Record .com, and it was for fans and. Um, you know, to donate, but not just donate, that they would, uh, I'd give something back in return. So I had all these different levels. So some would be, you know, the, you know, you get this, a CD and you get it signed, and other ones was I'll put you in the aligner notes, and then I had ones where I will write you a theme song you can put on your message machine and really give you two paragraphs of yourself, and, and those turned out really good. And then I had all the way up, to weapons grade plutonium, which was a total joke. Uh, for ten thousand dollars, you get to sing on my record, and I just did that. There were in between. The other thing about doing this is that I made it my personality. There's always a sense of humor, and I think, you know, so so I'd seen things before that were uh, kind of donation ban things, but they they were so generic and they didn't have the person's look or feel. So. But the ten thousand dollars someone did it came from the UK to sing on my record, and so. I, really, I thought that when I first did this, this could be a complete, it could have been my mother and her Mahjong friends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no expectations. And so, uh, for me, it was just a shot in the dark. But the one thing that I want to say is that I always had a good relationship with, with the fans, even you know, smaller but mighty fan base, because I was always really personal, always, you know, that there was a, before there was, you know, uh, as my mother called it, the face spaces, you know. And there was always, uh, you know, I always wrote people, there was a group about me, and I was always just really personal after shows. And I think that, I tried to translate that into that website. So uh, that's, that's my experience with that. You've been in the industry, by the time you got, by the time you launched that fan donation, you've been in the industry for nearly 20 years. So what would your advice be to say, artists that have been in the industry for a couple of years are looking to follow a similar model. Do you think that they actually have to put in, you know, there's a certain obviously amount of groundwork they have to put in beforehand. What would your advice be then be to them? It's not something you can launch overnight. Well, no, but that you don't have to do such a grand scheme thing. For instance, I did another thing where spend a day in the studio with me just to help me pay for one day in the studio where you can just see, you know, be there for the three-hour drum check, you know? <laughs> you know, people go off on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you don't have to do something. You can make it like pay for one day in the studio, so you don't have to make it such a grand thing. But the other thing in the last, you know, since, you know, I had it, my last M hit in 97, but I've been really, you know, a truth of war and, and, and going and playing, you know, uh, just working hard, just playing, you know, clubs, and, and, and I think that, that I actually have more fans than I did back then, just because of the hard work. So I think, you know, it's all this new, it's for me a mixture of old and new school and old school that you still have to yeah. go out and, and you know. Yeah, the of online marketing campaigns don't work without 
the fine effort. Fine effort, yeah. yeah. And, and the personal thing. I think there used to be a thing of uh, well, other people talk No, I can actually jump in. We did a similar <coughs> Kickstarter program um, when we were putting out our last album. We had finished a lot of the, pretty much most of the recording, uh, and got to a point and said we have no, we're out of money. And we sort of said, all right, what do we, what are our options? And had heard, you know, it was before a lot of the sites had actually launched the real Kickstarter programs. And uh, so we did a similar thing and said, uh, had a, a, a different list of, you know, we'll um, liner notes and things like that, pitching the liner notes or uh, play an acoustic show. We had uh, that we would come cook dinner for you and some friends and actually ended up doing now. I forget what the price point was, but uh, Dave and I cooked a lovely fajita dinner for one of our fans. And, you know, and I think it is the kind of thing that obviously you don't want to, you could, in the other direction, then spend all your time sort of fulfilling these, uh, these different promises that you made, but you know, I think the important thing is to make it special, and, and you, you said uh, that one of the problems was coming into the studio, and I think it gave, uh, it gives fans a very, much more specific than just saying, oh, I gave them some money and my name's in the liner notes, you know, we would say, we need this thousand dollars to mix the record, or we needed to master it, or we needed a trailer, you know, at one point we, we uh, had to get a new trailer, and so I think for a fan, to not only say I made a donation, but to say, you know what, I, I, I helped this thing. This, yeah. this thing exist. And, you know, it makes it more, that's, really that's what people are looking for more than just but throwing money at me. But the, the, the one thing I will say, uh, Jim, your, your question that's the most important one is how do you get there as a new artist? Mm -hmm. And you said it doesn't happen overnight. And the issue is it doesn't happen overnight. And, you know, I have... 20,000, I have 30,000 people on my constant contact list. I have 20,000 fans on Facebook, and I have, I'm going to my fourth account on my Facebook friends account. I have a Facebook group account. Now, these ideas, although we're doing some already, I guarantee you if you're a friend of Marcus Johnson or become one, you will see these in the next two weeks with my staff. <laughs> but the thing is though, I'm touching 70,000 people multiple times a week. The issue is how do you do that? every day. I want to talk a little bit about the grind. The whole new thing is the fact that you have all these, you know, interactive ways and electronic ways to touch people. If you're not also going out and engaging them, then you are not, they, they won't feel part of your family. So every time I go out and perform, I have an email list. My staff uh, will tell you that you will get yelled at or cussed out if you don't, not sell a CD. I don't care about the CD. That's ten or fifteen dollars. You don't put the email list out there. I am actually livid because that is our food for the future. That's every time you go out there. There are many different ways that you can do it, but when you you have to go out and grind, you have to go to the record stores, you have to go to any kind of retail outlet. You need to be at places like this. Everybody's card you get, go get a card scanner, scan it in. Make sure that you then take that and dump it into your contact, uh, constant contact list or MailChimp or you know these are other uh, uh, MailChimp.com is a is a competitor for constant contact and they have some really good templates and 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 then when you do that you're not just sending out a newsletter saying hey look this is where I'm playing every week you do that of course but you also say hey how you doing here's my quote of the week which is what we do we have now my new company uh, Flow Brands. Uh, for the for the love of, we have a flow lifestyle. So we talk about where I'm playing, anybody associated with me, where we're playing. We talk about my recording studio, which he's used. Uh, we talk about um, the food of the week. We talk about the travel vacation spot of the week. <coughs> and we talk about the, the health tip of the week. Why? Because you're just spamming if you're saying come to my game. People, I, I can find that out on your website. Tell me, make it engaging. And that's what we've forgotten. I, see, I think the, the biggest complaint I have about most labels, most artists, is that they have become lazy. And the reason sales are down in most places is focus is they're lazy. I mean, it, it, I don't know if you've seen the same thing, but and I know we may be preaching to the choir here because you're actually out here. But for instance, Friday night, Friday morning, Thursday night, I perform. Thursday, Thursday morning, so my office, Friday, Thursday night I performed, Sat Friday at seven o'clock, I got up to go do a gig, uh, I caught a flight to Orlando, um, to go for AARP's uh, 50th anniversary uh, at Disney. Did that with Dave Cox, um, 
God, it's so crazy. Then, then yesterday morning, I got on a plane and went to Fayetteville, North Carolina, where I played for a small group of people in Fayetteville. <coughs> but those people screamed and yelled. It was only like 30 people. They paid me, yes. But I got my email list. I hugged people. I sold a lot of CDs. That, at least, I broke even. Maybe made a little bit of money. Then today, and this is what happens, I got to the airport at 7 o'clock in the morning, and our plane broke. So then they sent in another plane, and it broke because it hit a bird on approach. And I'm like, I'm not supposed to be on the air today. <laughs> or in the air. So then what did we do? We have to get on the grind. We rented a car, a grand marquee. It wasn't pretty. And, you know, one of my boys who works with me, we drove up here so I could get here to this. Because I just got this, what she just said. I hope all you all write these down. And please don't come to any other kind of summit without a pen and a paper. This right here, in the next six months, will be fifty dollars to $100,000 for me. But it's the grind. I had to get here. I, I didn't think of some of the things she just said that she did. But I have played for people in my studio for Valentine's Day. But I guarantee you, they would love to be in the studio when I record and would love to pay for it. These are the things that we have to do, and it's so broad, the things that you have to do in the business, the things that you have to do online, the things that you have to do physically, the things that you have to sell physically, the things that you have to sell online, and it's the matrix, but you have to do it all. And that's where it's really hard right now, and if you see the bags under my eyes, that's what it's from. And guess where I go tonight? To Dallas Airport, because as soon as I leave here, I have to catch another plane to LA. It's, the new business is hard work. So but so Marcus, what do you do to stop yourself from being overwhelmed? What are the mechanisms that you have in place in terms of digital mechanisms, offline support? How, how do you manage it? You want to know the truth? How do I? How do I? P ninety X. For real. I mean, I work out a lot, but as it relates to the mechanisms, <laughs> seriously, hey, P ninety X works a lot. Twenty pounds. You want to see the sun here? Um, uh, uh, for real. You know, we use Facebook, but I'll t here's the thing. The, and, and, and anybody can, can jump in. What I'm starting to find is that the lifestyle is kind of changing. We're moving from this physical thing to something in between this and this. But in North Carolina, a woman said, can I buy one of your tapes last night? <laughs> so the market is so bright. And, it, <laughs> can I, and, and had a CD, can I buy this tape? I mean, the market is so fragmented that you have to figure out, one, you have to spend time reading the books to figure out what your consumers do, because they really run everything. So a hip hop consumer is gonna experience music much differently than a jazz person, and my market is a little bit older than everybody else, so, but they're in between. So I have to have ringtones, and I have to have CDs, and then I really, that some people don't have emails. If you believe that some people do not have, if you, well, if you think everybody in America has email, you're sadly mistaken, but you know what they have? A job. And they have $30 where they'll come in and buy two or three of my CDs. And then if you send them, if you send something in the mail, they'll come out to your concert and they'll go and knock on everybody else's door. So I think it's a mixture. I think you use things like, you know, physical mail lists for jazz artists, I would say, where you're still doing direct mail in certain, cir you know, in certain circumstances. If you can find a sponsor, to help you with that, that's great because they can, you know, help with that scale of that. We use Facebook. We use, oh my God, we have like 15 web properties. Uh, um, you know, MySpace, we use Nimbit, we use uh, TuneCore, we use Reverb Nation, we use um, OurStage.com. Uh, I mean, and then we use our, our, our number one most effective way get people into performances because that's where I'm finding the money is. The, the true live interaction at the gigs and people paying 20 and $30 to go in there is through our constant contact list and sending out our regular weekly newsletter and then at the end of the week we send out a diary saying what's going on for the week. That, that's email right now to me is still, you know, when people are going. It, it's for my, and I'll say this, who I'm reaching out And honestly, how you, we were talking earlier about you know, going back to this whole thing of not feeling overwhelmed. You said earlier that actually all of these direct fan um, online marketing tools has actually given you time to be more creative. Can you tell us a little bit more about 
your experiences and basically <laughs> Sure, absolutely. Um, touching on, on something Marcus said, and I've, I've been observing quietly in the back for quite some time today, and there's one thing I've noticed about a lot of the panel. I haven't heard a lot of talk about how good the music should be. I've heard plenty of talk about um, how you should get the music out there, but why should people listen in the first place? Um, there hasn't been a lot of talk about quality of music. And I've learned personally from my experiences as a hip hop artist that the better the music, the easier it is to get the music out there. And one of the most important tools that I've used to get my music out there has been blogs. Uh, how many of you all read blogs? You get music from blogs? Is that how you find out about it? Um, blogs are the new magazines for us. And I've discovered that there's been somewhat of a rebirth in tastemakers. And by tastemakers, I mean that one person, when you give them your music or they hear your music, they tell other people about it, and then those people know who you are. Um, for me, all of those things have made my job a lot easier and it allowed me more time to be creative. Uh, it's allowed me to focus my efforts more specific, um, which sites I should go to, who I should give exclusive remixes to. You know, I use Bandcamp quite often for a lot of my releases. And I'll get emails constantly from websites saying, Odyssey, can I get a free track for my up and coming compilation mixtape that we're gonna release on our site? Or some clothing company that says, we're gonna have a CD released with our next clothing line. We'd love to have a free track. Free, 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 free. <laughs> and I'm saying to myself, if I did all of these tracks and they're all trying to convince me that it's worth my while, how much time would I actually have to create music that I would benefit from? So I go on Bandcamp and I look at my BuzzFeed and I discover these are the top 10 sites that are generating the most traffic to my music and where most of my downloads are coming from. So if you're not in my top 10 sites and you send me an email saying, can I get a free track? I don't have to burden myself, I don't have to worry about it. I don't look at it, I don't pay attention to it. Those top 10 websites, those top 10 blogs who are giving me traffic, I've already emailed them saying, can I give you a free track? And that's allowed me to sit back in my room and just create, you know? Uh, looking at statistics and saying, where should I go to do my shows? Where should I focus touring? I don't have to play a guessing game any longer of this is of just reaching out to X amount of promoters across the country and across the world and praying that they reach back to me and that they're interested. I know exactly who's interested and I'm coming to them saying, you really should book me because I have a couple thousand email addresses in your city right now and I think that we could come out and do a great show. So as an artist, I'm kind of the sum of everything you've been hearing today on this panel. I use Bitly to track click-through rates, I use SoundCloud, I use Bandcamp, I use Twitter. Um, and I use them effectively, you know? My best advice to artists who use these social networks is to incorporate yourself and your music into everything that it is that you do. Don't be too one-sided on, on the other. For every tweet that I put out about a link to my music, I'm also putting something personal or maybe something that's connected to the music. If the song has a specific subject matter, let's say I release a song about cold weather, for example. My tweet before that would be like, I'm freezing. And the tweet after that would be like, I just bought some boots, check them out. And I'll tweet about the boots and then say, yo, just what I just did, I just made a song about cold weather. People listen to that song and download it and then relate to it a lot more. So I kind of mix uh, myself and my music together. And it, it's actually just uh, allowed me to be a lot more relaxed about what I create. So basically, have being targeted in your approach, find out what works for you is the best is the best method. That's your advice to artists. Absolutely. Do you think that you have to go through a certain process of trial and error before you find out what works for you? And do you think that actually sometimes you start using certain tools online or offline that, could, that don't necessarily fit into your brand and personality? could essentially be damaging. Sure, sure. It's definitely a trial and error as far as um, what can work for you. I took a lot of risk and I was fortunate enough that I had the stability to take those risks. In 2006, um, I had a record that I released for free online. And this was before Bandcamp. Uh, I wasn't using Bandcamp at the time, so it was all about download numbers. 
And I released this record for free in 2006, and it got tens of thousands of downloads. And then I approached the record company and said, you should put this album out. And they looked at me like I was crazy. They said, your album's been out for a year already, with tens of thousands of downloads, why should I release this record? I said, well, the new incentive for people to purchase music is no longer because they have to, it's because they want to. And that's a risk that I was willing to take in. Uh, a label in Arizona named Mellow Music believed in that risk, and they released the record, and it recouped in a month, and it's been in profit ever since. And it makes plenty of money on iTunes every month. I'm very pleased with those checks. This is a record that came out for free and was out for a year already because my fans are connected to me as a person. Um, they want to support my music because they understand that if they do, it allows me to continue to make music. So it was a risk I took that work for me, but I was already in a position where people had known my releases previously. If you were someone just starting out, you might have to take a different approach. So it's definitely a level, you just have to be a risk taker. Yeah. And when do you think in that process, in, that, with, in the direct fan process, you can start realizing when you can create revenue from your fan relationships? Is there a certain point where you just go, ding, I can start off with money now? Or is it something that's very organic? That's a tough question. I think for me, it, it works per release. There's certain releases that I'll put more effort into, and I make that very transparent to my fans. And my fans know, listen, he put a lot of effort into this one. This is something that I should support monetarily. There are other releases where I'll just be in the whim of creating something literally today and decide to release it tomorrow. That'll be free. But what I've noticed is for every free release I put out, I purposely put out something for sale. And it's almost like a gift. I give you this record today and in two weeks I'll have a record for sale. And my fans will support that because I gave them something for free. And like all the other panels, before using these social networks and statistics to target my fan base and my buying market. Uh, I use your mailing list provider as my mailing list provider and uh, when I put a link in my email list to my new album on iTunes, I see exactly who went to iTunes and what do I do? I'll send them a follow up email specific and just say, yo, here's a new remix I just did. Thank you for your support. And they think it just came from the sky. But I saw that they went to iTunes and purchased my music, or spent some time on iTunes looking at it. And I'll take care of them, and I nurture my fan base, and I build my core audience, so that anything that I do, they support me as a person, also as an artist. So you're being very strategic, that's what you do. Absolutely. But personal, thanks. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, and, and I think, you know, what he said is, it depends. I teach a class, a business development class, and, and what I tell my students, first day of class is that the only thing that really matters is the consumer. And it goes back to whether or not they like your music and, and who and what they are. I mean, it's beyond demographics. That's very important. But it's the psychographics. It's how they live, how they do what they do. And, you know, I, I'm not going to say that some jazz or smooth jazz folks who are, you know, trying to pay their bills and drink milk, you know, and or, or just provide for their families. In these times, it's, it's very difficult for them to, to even download stuff. So sometimes what they'll do is, they'll say, look, I couldn't download it, I didn't buy your CD, but I'm gonna come to your concert, but I'm coming to this concert six months from now when you play Blues Alley in December. So I, I think it's very important for you to know who your consumer is, what they do, where they do it, why. Why they do it is very important. Why do they download to a, a phone versus their computer or now an iPad. Now you know not to do your iPad, your, your website in, in Flash because you know Flash doesn't work on an iPad. And what's the number one consumer product right now? Well, it's an iPad. So these are things that, that you have to look out for. The other thing I'll say too is, I use my status update of Facebook to ask. I, I, I read a book, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, um, back when I was here at Georgetown, and one of the things that they talked about is active support and passive support. Your active support are like the people you live with, your mom, your dad, your wife, your husband, they know what you do. They know, like, you know, Marcus needs some help, can I, you need some help, bro? Your passive support are those people who would help you if they knew. So, 
for a new artist coming up, what I would do is I ask my friends, hey look, I'm having a, a concert. Can you bring two people? I'll get you in free. Um, where do you all think I should play? <coughs> and I do that all the time on Facebook. Hey, I need to get, I'm going to Detroit. Does anybody know of a club that I can slip into? I just went, recently went to the Dominican Republic and on Facebook there was a group that does jazz in the Dominican Republic and I was like, well, where should I go? They're like, well, we do a, a Wednesday night session and a, and a Friday night session. They will tell you if you ask them. So use these, you know, use the demographic information that you're getting from your, your, your Facebook uh, on the fan page, I forget what they call it, the stats. Use that, but use your status report to talk to people and ask them the questions. I, I promise you, your fans and friends will help you out. So Joe, just getting back to the question of, as a new artist, where do you start, what do you do? Um, your band have been around for about five or six years now, so relatively. Right. What did you do when you first got together, and how do you sort of divide the activity <coughs> between the entire band? Uh, well, there's a couple of sides. I would touch on um, the most being, as far as advice for a new artist, um, you know, a lot of this talk about Twitter, and like, yes, you have to have a Twitter, yes, have a Facebook, get on Reverb Nation, you know, use all these internet tools, but as far as being, finding that core of Show going fans. Like, we're trying to put people in the seats. We spent a lot of time the first couple years in the band sort of figuring out the landscape, and, and a lot of it we did spend in front of the computer and we spent, um, you know, and reaching out to blogs. It's all very important stuff, but really what worked for us, what was an undeniable uh, tool for us, and you talked about hard work, and this was as hard as it gets, but going last summer before, right after our record came out, we went to every single show at Meriwether the Post Pavilion, and we hit every person, and, you know, just 200 people in line just sitting there waiting to get into this show. You know they're show going people, you know what show they're going to see, so you know if, you know, obviously you want to target that, you go to whatever show is appropriate for your music. Um, you know, and you go up to people one on one with a pair of headphones or just, you know, and it's not, because we also have done that, uh, you've seen the people sitting outside of concerts and they, and they pass a flyer and they probably got 10 bucks to sit there and pass out a flyer to every person. And I think your return rate is close to zero on that. The, the important thing for us to realize and it's you're putting yourself out there but you have to you know step inside somebody's bubble and say hey I'm out here this is this is me I'm the artist I mean you can we have some street teamers who've done it and, and I think that has the same effect you can say I really believe in this band and that's why I'm walking up to you right now and talking to them but you know if it can come from the artist directly that's even better, you know, and a lot of people will even say, maybe this isn't type of my type of music, or, you know, usually I wouldn't buy your CD, usually I wouldn't take your flyer, but I admire that you had the balls to like to walk up to me. You know, people really, as much as the internet has opened so many doors for, you know, for artists, there's still that very old school hustle, like there's a reason that that works. Um, you know, and I think I attribute that to a lot of our success as far as playing, uh, you know, we, we just played 9.30 Club and Ramshead Live, and some of these venues, the bands are always saying, how do you break into these venues? And it's getting out there, like I said, putting in that hard work, um, you know, even on, the, on a very personal level. Volunteer. I know you don't want to hear that. I still do it. My last five records were in the top 10 of Billboard, two were in the top five. Last one was nominated for an NAACP Image Award with Vanessa Williams and Christian McBride and uh, Wynn Marcellus. Yeah. And uh, I, I did a volunteer gig last week. Volunteer, let people hear what you do. And you know, I get people all the time that are like, well, how do I get da 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 da? Because I'm not playing for free. Well, give me the promoter's name, because I'll call them up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, but I'm, 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 I swear to you, I'm dead serious. You should have an allocation of the amount of free performances and product that you will give out. Like you're saying here, he gives out the free remix and then comes behind him with something. I guarantee you this. If you do a lot of performance and your stuff rocks, and you have product and merchandise, you will, at bare minimum, break even. At bare minimum. And then guess what? Then you get that email list, right? So if there are 10 people there, that's 10. If there are 200, there are 200. You take that 200, keep in touch with them. Hey, I'm doing another free performance. We'll have our merchandise and our CDs there. 
those 200 tell, say they tell only another 100. That's 300 people now. You're starting to build your, your sales force and your families. <coughs>
So if you ask somebody in France, hey, what do you do? Can you help me get a club? I have people running around doing that out there. And they did it in the beginning. Even when I had my little old, you know, oh my God, the picture was so horrible. Uh, my first CD, it's almost embarrassing, but there were only 500 of them made. And you know what? I sold those first 500 in the first week. If you just ask people to help you, they will help you. You don't have to do it all on your own. You really don't. I, I, I want to, someone asked me if I uh, had any ever problems with stalkers or stalker fans, and I said, yeah, I put them to work. I go, he was a stalker, you know, and then all of a sudden they're like, so over you. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> Show improve 
um, make sure that they're giving you opportunities that you know full and well you can't get for yourself. And when they give you those opportunities, take care of them, do an excellent job, answer the phone, respond immediately, you know, go out when they tell you to go out and you'll start to build a good relationship. Yeah. There's a lot of artists who don't do that, trust me. Yeah, I, you know, it's like artists send me inquiries about booking there, and then, then I send them, like, conditions, you know, because top conditions at, at my, the space that I run, and rather than say, no, uh, those conditions aren't acceptable, I just never hear back from them. It yeah. annoys the heck out of this. I'm never going to deal with it again. I'm curious what uh, email management system you use, and also if you use uh, Bandcamp, do you release your album at a different price than iTunes, and how do, how do you work that? Uh, I use your mailing list provider. Okay. Um, for me, it's extremely effective for the price. Uh, I also use Bandcamp, but I honestly use Bandcamp for my free releases. I've created that as the central place for free downloads. Um, the main reason is to, was to combat the bootleggers of my music who would just take my music and reduce it to track names, and one track would be here in Bulgaria, and the other track would be in China, and no one would know the album came out. So I use it to centralize my download so that if you are going to download, you'll download it for me and I'll get the data from it. Uh, we currently actually use your mailing list provider as well, um, but we're in the process of switching over um, to a, a company called Banzoogle. Uh, they basically are trying to solve a lot of the problems where you have uh, you know, one company, your mailing list provider, YMLP, whatever, you do your mailing list, you have another one with your online store, you have your hosting through one company, you have your, uh, you know, all these different facets, and they're trying to bring it all together. Um, we happened, one of the, uh, this summer we won a, uh, basically a, a grand prize winner, Ari Swing Birch from the music seminar, won the prizes, it happened to be a two year subscription to Van Zubel. Whether or not we would have switched over without that, um, but once we started looking into it, it made sense. You know, you don't have time, even just remembering passwords to seven different uh, outlets that you use. Um, so I think that's where a lot of the industry is going, is trying to figure out how to integrate, how to make it easier. Um, so, I mean, check back in like six months and I'll, I'll and, it if it's been good. But. And Nimbit, which is their competitor. <laughs> uh, yeah, Nimbit, Nimbit, same idea. And, they have a whole thing on like you. You would think that they created the term D two F. You know what I mean? The way that they write about it, but it, it's a good functional uh, 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 product. And they just released Instant Man, yeah, which is you know really helps pull things together. It, and I call that market defragmentation. So that they really whoever wins that game wins the music industry. By the way. I mean, when you guys are talking about charity causes, like, I definitely feel like every musician should be aligned to some sort. So I have two questions. And the first is, um, do you guys work with any charities that bring uh, music to the public schools into schools? And do you recommend any of those charities? Because that's something I'm passionate about. And the second question is, uh, what are your guys' favorite causes? Or what do you support um, charity-wise? Are you welcome? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm I'm always the one that they call for for free things. So uh, I've done a, uh, work. One of my favorite ones is FAM, Families Against Mandatory Minimums, because I think it's it's also they don't do uh, they're they're not as known as they should, and they, they were the ones responsible actually for Clinton who was president for getting the pardons for the drug offenders. It's just so many people for in jail for nonviolent crimes, and they're really uh, it's crazy. Not me. Yeah, not people. Yeah. So and uh, so that's and right now I'm trying to put something together and I know I'm talking to uh, a lot of people for um, it's it's the um, family Venice Family Clinic and it's a free clinic in, in Venice. He's been involved in charitable schools because it just comes down to this whole thing of making an artist more personal and also maybe you can reach out to fans in of a different demographic or a different area who may not have considered your music but actually want you because they realize there's a side to you. There's an affinity. Yeah, there's an affinity. Well, they can relate to it and, and therefore you're introducing, as a result, you're introducing your music to Right. Them. Well, I was part of what it was the Tell Us the Truth tour. It was great because I'm very different than, than a lot of the other artists, but they, everyone knows I'm, I'm a, an activist. But, you know, so I was on a bill with, you know, 
uh, Boots Riley from the coup and, and uh, uh, Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine and Steve Earle and Billy Bragg and it was just, it was fantastic and I also I thought those were great because they, you know, everything is so compartmentalized in music now. When I was a kid and I'm showing my age, the stations would play like a, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so I like, I, I'm talking about something else, but it was no. so great to have that, um, it was so nice that, you mentioned schools. But it brought me up, but it gave me, I was just saying that, that it brought me, someone was saying, you know, I wouldn't normally listen to your music, but I came to your show because I saw you with those guys. So sometimes that happens. Yeah. So uh, the direct fan mechanism in a different yeah. way. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there's any good charity that uh, musicians can support that help bring music to schools. Because as musicians, we should be oh. investing into the next generation for a musician. I'm uh, sorry, uh, I will say that, you know, the, if you go on the Lennon recording bus, it's uh, Yoko actually, funds it, and, and the Lennon bus goes to schools and they show kids, the little school, and they'll show them how to, uh, how to record, that they'll record a song that day in the school and show them how to do it and do a little video, so it's the uh, John Lennon recording. Speaking of, kind of looking for shows outside of the box or, or you know places that you wouldn't always think to, to align yourself with, we were actually approached by a credit union of all people um, to their starting program at, at high schools and middle schools uh, and trying to teach kids financial responsibility, fiscal responsibility, and decided for some reason it was a good idea to tap a rock band for, uh, to speak on on behalf. But you know, so we've done a couple of these, and um, you know, it's interesting to to be sort of put into that. Uh, one, to try to meld rock and roll and financial responsibility. An interesting task on our own. Not, not the easiest feat, but, uh, you know, it, it's sort of, you always have to keep your eyes open to opportunities like that. That's not something I would ever, you know, reach out to a credit union and say, hey, do you want to start, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm really good with credit cards. I, I'm really comfortable with credit card debt. And uh, I, can, I can tell these kids, you know, what to do, but, uh, you know, just kind of keeping your eyes open. And, and don't just look at charities. Look at the, the term is community. What do they call it now? Community community investment. Meaning, basically, I'm going into the community because I'm looking for a return on investment for each dollar that I put in. There's no more like corporate giving division of a company. They're looking for a return. It's another form of marketing, cost marketing. So the other thing I would just say is, if you believe in giving back to kids in schools, go back to your elementary school. If you don't live here, if, say you're in college and it's, you know, there, there's schools right down the street, like Duke Ellington needs you, you know what I mean? To come in there and teach some of those kids just different things about music. And they're fighting that, that struggle right here in D.C. You can go across to Arlington, Alexandria, pick a school. And what you'll find out is as soon as you start doing it, you'll start getting the answers to all your other questions. So we have time for one more question. Uh, just to follow up on that, there's also a place called the Sitar Art Center, which is in D.C that provides arts to uh, uh, kids here in the D.C. area. We did a benefit for them uh, this year, uh, and that would be a good one. The question I have is, um, whenever I see panels, everyone talks about the different musical tools that they have, everything from band camp to constant contact, things like that. Uh, what tools that aren't necessarily musically related are you using on a daily basis to, to be able to create, you know, to keep your business moving forward? What things are keeping your tasks organized and you know uh, the the processes that you go through and things and just you organize in general so that you can actually get things done on all of the different networks and all the different tools that you have. Uh, most important tool in my arsenal is people skill. Um, a lot of artists don't have them. They, they don't have media training. They don't socialize. They can't articulate themselves. Uh, they don't know how to interact with their fans. They volunteer too much information, not enough. Um, people skills is the most important one. And I use people skills every single day, communicating through emails to book shows, calling record labels or licensing companies that want to use my instrumentals, etc. You have to have a gift of gab, so to speak, to know how to talk. Um, my calendar and my phone, syncing that using uh, Google, Mac, Google Calendar, uh, I'd be lost without my calendar. I double book myself all the time, and my phone's just like, hey, you can't do that, today. You got something already. I'm like, really? I really want to do that. I actually argue with it, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> really important for me uh, is my calendar, definitely. And um, yeah, my people skills, 
organizing myself with my calendar, extremely crucial. Google, Google Docs, Google, they just started, Google they just Docs, added three yeah. yeah. to that. Um, yeah, we do tons of, all, you know, all our, a lot of times you do your best work in a, in a room together, you know, as a band, as a business, with your management, whatever, but that's not the case most of the time. So having, you know, everything accessible in Docs and, and calendar and all that. Exactly. What are you using? You're a front man of the band, you manage the band, you've got your own record label, you've got your own printing company. Uh, how do you, what are you using? Uh, I use a lot of different tools. Uh, one of the ones that I found is Remember the Milk, which actually syncs up with uh, Google Calendar. So you can say, I call it Remember, Remember the Milk. Remember the Milk. It's a free product, uh, rememberthemilk.com. Uh, it allows you to, to organize all your tasks on separate lists, uh, and then you can also <coughs> share those lists with other people. Um, so if other people have an account, uh, remember the bill, you can create a list that you both can add things to and take things off of. Um, <coughs> Gmail has been incredible. Um, you know, the calendars, you know, everything, um, the docs, uh, absolutely. Yammer, Y A M E R. Yeah, Yammer is another one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and I know we're, we have to get ready to get out of here, and, and I'm going to cut you off just for two seconds. A couple of books that I recommend that I make my class read. Number one is Gary Vaynerchuk. He's a guy who built a $100 million wine brand. The name of the book is called Crush It. And he talks about how to build your own personal brand from scratch. All right. Now, two magazines that I'd recommend because, again, my assumption is that even though you turn the switch off sometimes, which I do agree with when you get in that studio, you all are now CEOs of your own brands. Right? So you're business people. When you look at how many cash flow sources you have, you're a multifunctional CEO. Okay? So Inc. Magazine is very, very important to you because you need to understand what's going on in business in general. Also, um, Fast Company Magazine, because I find a lot of solutions in Fast Company Magazine. And you put those three things together, um, the, the last one, you can take it or not, is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And that's just an overall business strategy. You can Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And uh, my students are forced to read that uh, every semester. And at the end of the semester, they're like, oh my god. But that was a book that actually changed my life. Those magazines changed my life. And Crush It is a very, easy way to start understanding the, the grand landscape of social network marketing and using it to build a personal brand. Yeah. I think looking outside of the music world and getting ideas from the business world and other industries is really, it's just really beneficial to sort of fuel your career. So we're going to have to wrap up now, but if I could just get in a couple of sentences just to sort of take away from the audience what you feel are the ingredients to a successful direct and marketing campaign. Obviously, the, the secret ingredients, um, not so secret. Sure, sir. Something I've said my entire career is never fall victim to underdevelopment and overexposure. Uh, don't let the social networks consume you. Cultivate your craft. Do your best to focus on your music for as much as possible, and then use the social networks. And limit yourself. You know, find time, find balance, and prioritize yourself. And most importantly. Be a social person, know how to talk to people, know how to communicate to people, and, and most importantly, be objective. Know how to step outside of your music and view it and hear it as other people do. Uh, be a sponge for as much information as possible. Read all the time and read everything because what is happening out here with people is called economics. Somebody's deciding whether to buy some toilet paper and toothpaste or your music. And in a rough economy, you need to figure that out. Now, the other thing is to have the balls to ask them to help you out and to vote for you in your campaign. We definitely need you to support us here. <coughs> On stage, ask them. Hey, sometimes I'll say, it's just like a church. I'm asking you. I need your support. I'm an entrepreneur. Please buy my CD. And if you don't, please sign my email list so I can ask you at another show or on email to buy my CD. And the last thing is just don't take no for an answer. You do not accept no. And it's not about finding it, it's about creating it. Spend the time figuring out how to create your strategy. I'm assuming that your music is high. All right, once you got that, you do not take no for an answer and make <coughs> something new happen. Yeah, you touched briefs on this, but ideas, you know, new ideas. By the time 
you're hearing about it at a panel or at a conference, it's too late. Like that that means it's already being it's already out there, it's already happening. Look at what's look at what people are doing, look at what's working and say, what can I do? How can I make this better? How can I make this work in a different way? Or how can I take this tool that's 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 on the forefront and, and turn this around? Um, and also fans as well. And, and right. transparent and also fans what they want. And, and right, and as if you're an artist, it's it is all about the fans, you know, you have to keep that uh, to keep that unfortunately or fortunately, yeah, you know, keep that in mind. I don't know, I just think that also use sometimes rather than imitate, you use what is your unique personality, uh, unless you have a bad personality. So yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, that, that uh, thing that you have unique, maybe that's the time to bring it out. Great, well thank you very much for our panelists um, and to all.